Thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you for everyone for, for showing up here this morning. Uh, really just, uh, I'm excited to be here. Really impressed with Alex and the whole team. Uh, I know, you know, I've never put on a conference, but I've, I've participated in it. I know this stuff is really hard. So just want to give credit, kudos to you, Alex, and everybody that had something to do with putting this on. Because since the first moment Alex reached out for me to come and speak about the intersection of cloud and security, I've been impressed with the professionalism uh, to the traveling, to getting registered, to the party last night at City Museum, and to all of this stuff. So just uh, really kudos to you, and it's great to be back in person. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm not staring at a screen right now and that I'm wearing pants, uh, which is uh, a little bit of a change here, right? Uh, so uh, again, thank you, Alex. Great job. I want to just give you a round of applause because this has been awesome. So any, uh, any other first-timers here? Any, any first-time Strange Loopers here? Me too. So glad that I'm, I'm not alone there too. Yeah. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. Uh, my first time in St. Louis, first time at Strange Loop. Extremely excited to be, to be speaking to you all today about the intersection of cloud and security. And really my goal today of this talk is to kick off a conversation. Uh, make sure that as you go through all these rest of the sessions today and tomorrow, you go back to your organizations we start to think about security a little bit differently. We start to think about security earlier on and, and wonder, are we doing things uh, with, with security mindset in, in place? So I don't expect everyone here to agree with everything I have to say. I, I don't expect you to, to do the things that I, I might try to demo here if the demo gods allow me uh, later on. But I do hope that uh, we challenge some of these original ways that you've been thinking about security. So let's, let's go ahead and get into it. A little bit about myself, I am the founder and CEO of ByteCheck, and, and ByteCheck's a cybersecurity SaaS company really with one focus, make compliance suck less. Uh, we all know compliance sucks, uh, at least I do, uh, for sure, and, and our goal is, you know, we built an automated solution to, to make that process easier. I, I sit on a few boards, uh, spent some time in the U.S. Army uh, as a signal officer for a few years. Uh, actually joined the Army because I broke both ankles playing basketball at Florida State, uh, ended up making it on the team and playing a little bit. So if anybody out there likes college hoops or likes to talk about college hoops, let's, let's meet out there and have a good conversation. Uh, I, I teach a class at SANS on continuous automation and, and cloud compliance. So compliance is, is my thing. And, and uh, you're not here to hear about me. So I'll, I'll go ahead and, and get right into this talk. Uh, by the way, connect with me on all those social platforms, at AJ Yan on, on all of those, definitely. So I can't give a talk about security being the biggest benefit of the cloud without talking about some of these other benefits, right? We, we got to start there about what are the other benefits. If you go out and do a Google search of cloud computing and, and why you're moving to the cloud, this is what you're going to see listed, right? You're going to hear about the cost savings. And I get a little bit of PTSD when I, when I hear about cost savings because I learned everything that I know about the cloud just poking around and, and tinkering. And I definitely got that one bill that one time when I left too many resources running. And uh, I did not think the cloud was about cost savings when that happened, um, for sure. Uh, but as a small business owner, as a you know, startup founder, definitely. I save a lot of money running my workload in the cloud. It's a lot easier. I don't have to guess uh, my capacity. I, I, I don't have to worry about, am I going to need to pre-purchase a lot of things? I kind of can do that on an on-demand basis. And that's a huge benefit. Uh, we obviously can move fast, right? Uh, we can do things in a faster manner. We can scale faster. It's really elastic, and, and that's one of the benefits of the cloud, that kind of infinite storage that you have there. Um, and of course, we're no longer spending money on running our data centers. I know as a compliance guy, I used to walk around into those physical data centers and look at the raised floors, check the, check the cabinets, do those long walkthroughs, looking at all the cameras. Luckily, we don't have to do that no more. You know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they they all do that for us, which is, which is really great. But there's something missing here, right? Uh, there's, there's this one element missing, and it's security. Uh, and you know, you're probably like, AJ, this is, you titled your talk, Why Security is the Biggest Benefit of the Cloud, and you didn't even list security as a benefit on the slide. I, I did that on purpose. Um, that wasn't, wasn't a mistake. And really, it's because that's what you're going to see. If you go out there and look and see what are the benefits of the cloud, what are the reasons why I want to use cloud computing, generally you're not going to run into anyone saying security is that thing. Uh, security is the thing that's going to be a big, huge aspect of you getting into, into cloud computing. And I think that's for a few reasons, right? Uh, number one is business. 
most companies, I'm sure most of your companies out there, unless you're a cybersecurity software company or cybersecurity business, you're not in the business of security. You're not doing security for your business. So moving fast, being able to get new features out to your customers, being able to save money, being able to reduce the operational overhead of all the things that you're doing to run your, your workloads, that's a business driver. Uh, and the business is obviously going to drive uh, a lot of these conversations. So I think security is often left out. I think security and those kind of drivers around speed are often seen as opposing forces, uh, which I don't necessarily agree with. I, I, I think security actually can speed you up, especially if you start it earlier on in your process, earlier on in your pipeline. You can eliminate a lot of rework, eliminate a lot of uh, uh, manual labor by some of the security teams if you do it earlier. But that's another talk for another conference around security and speed. Uh, but you know, the other reason I think that we don't hear about security is because it's, you often hear folks talking about security in the cloud as if it's way different than security not in the cloud. You know, they're, they're, things are called differently, obviously, and, and I think that's fair. But when we think about it at its core, some of the core security concepts, the basics, you know, you want to protect your identities. You want to make sure that you understand your perimeter and, and protect from outside sources outside of that boundary. You want to identify vulnerabilities. You want to respond to them. Those are all simple concepts that apply regardless of where you're running your workload, right? This is something that is going to be important to you. And I think that mindset of, oh, security is just really different. It just goes get put on a shelf. Um, and those challenges are just kind of stuck out there. Uh, and they're like, oh, we'll think about that later. We're going to worry about the cost benefits. We're going to worry about scalability. We're going to worry about all these other things that drive the business. And that security stuff's a little bit different in the cloud, so let's just move that over there. Um, and I think that starts really with when you're building your applications or if you're migrating to the cloud. Uh, and there's these concepts that you'll hear about, uh, these seven R's that AWS says or Gartner released back in 2011, five R's. Uh, and I'll just do a quick uh, disclaimer here. I'm going to say a lot about AWS. I don't work for AWS. They don't know who I am. Um, and I, they don't need any more marketing from me. I think they're solid there. But that's just where I built ByteCheck. That's where I carved out my experience. So a lot of the things that I reference will be related to AWS, but they apply to those other cloud providers. Uh, this is not a, an AWS marketing talk. It's just what I know. Uh, so that's where we're going we're gonna to go. But these seven R's, or there, there's five here. AWS has a couple other ones that are about not moving to the cloud, so it doesn't make a ton of sense. But I think the, what I normally see as I'm talking to customers that are getting into the cloud, that are trying to build workloads on the cloud, maybe spin up a new application in the cloud, I see this rehost method. I see this lift and shift where I'm going to take this Oracle database I have and I'm just going to go throw it on the EC2 instance in the cloud. I'm not going to try to do it in a cloud native way. I'm not thinking about it any differently. I'm just like, hey, like, cool, I'm going to go run this in the, in the cloud the same exact way I'm running it in another environment or the same exact way I used to, I, I used to do this. And I don't think that's the right answer. You know, I think what we should see and when we'll start to see more conversations about security is if we refactor or re-architect. If we're thinking about how can I redesign this in a cloud native way to take advantage of all of these cool technologies and services that are there, that I can really start to do things differently. Maybe I don't need to expose uh, my Bastion host out to the internet anymore because of some of the things that you can do on these cloud providers. Uh, maybe I don't need to run that workload exactly the same way. I can run that Oracle database on Aurora um, in the cloud and take advantage of some of the things that they do from an elast elastic and a scalability perspective. So I think this is really where we get it wrong. Early on, it's a mindset shift. It's a, it's a thinking, uh, thinking about things as you're thinking about moving to the cloud. And, and it's uh, a lot of it, like I said before, it's because we don't think of security as a benefit. We're not saying like, hey, this is something that can solve some of the problems that I know I have from a modern security perspective. And a few of the modern security challenges that we see out there, that I see all the time, uh, that uh, apply regardless of where you're hosted, whether that's cloud, whether that's on-prem, whatever you're doing, you're, you're still going to want to know, um, there goes my top to my water, you're still going to want to know where are your resource is at. Uh, what's going on in your environment? Uh, can I see who's doing what? Do I have control over that? Do I know what they're doing, where they're going, and how they're going about it? 
Uh, you want to be able to respond to events. You want to be able to identify an event and then respond to that and do that as fast as possible and eliminate that time between detection and response. Uh, with the ever increasing perimeter in our modern environments, that's a concern of a lot of folks in the security space. It's how do I know what my boundary is? You know, you used to be able just to draw a line around your boundary, throw up a network diagram and say, hey, this is, this is the boundary of my network, this is the boundary of my environment really difficult to do now in these, in these really distributed environments, and that increasing perimeter is a concern. That attack surface is just continuing to explode, and that's a modern security challenge. Of course, I'm a compliance guy, so I got to talk a little bit about compliance, right? And obviously, you know, I know there's somebody here groaning. They, they might have threw up in their mouth when I said compliance, uh, <laughs> and I get it. Uh, I 100% get it. You know, we often hear compliance is not security. 100% agree. You can achieve a compliance certification without being secure. You can pull that wool over your auditor's eyes. You can trick them. Um, I can show you how. Uh, but I do believe security is compliance. If we just flip that saying around and we focus on those basics, we focus on some of these things, and we focus on security, you're going to meet those compliance frameworks. I don't care which one it is. They, they all say the same thing, whether FedRAMP, ISO, SOC 2, PCI. They're all really saying the same thing. It's just a matter of who you're paying that's different. And if you focus on security, and we can say security is compliance, you're going to be able to achieve those. And I know a lot of CISOs out there, they have a million compliance frameworks that they're trying to comply with. And their solution generally is, let's just throw another SaaS solution at it. Let's just get another SaaS solution out there. And you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I obviously make my money off of selling a SaaS solution, so I'm kind of taking money out of my mouth right now. But I don't think that you need another SaaS solution to solve these security problems. A lot of these things you can do in a cloud-native way without throwing a bunch of tools at, at, at it. I, I run into, I just recently was talking to a, a company a few, few weeks ago. They have four different SaaS solutions that do the same exact thing. They're not using any of them. I'm just like, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? And you probably can do this right on the cloud. Uh, and that's where today I'm going to really talk about how we can solve some of these problems, some of these challenges in our, in our environments in a cloud-native way, in a manner where we're taking advantage of those services. We're doing some refactoring, re-architecting to say, how can I leverage what's already built on these cloud providers uh, that will allow me to handle some of these security challenges? How can I use that, that intersection of all of the resources that are there from a cloud perspective and improve the security of my environment and do it at scale. Uh, I think about a lot of myself, you know, running uh, the, the bite check application. Without the cloud, the stuff that we're able to do from a security perspective would not be possible. I'm a really small, we're a really small company, under 10 folks, uh, not a lot of people with hands on keyboards most days. So it's it'd be really challenging if I wasn't automating things and leveraging a lot of these services to help protect our application and protect our customers' data. So when we talk about security in the cloud, you'll, you'll see here that I capitalized this N, and that's really because of the shared responsibility model, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, where the cloud providers are responsible for the security of the cloud. You know, they're going to be responsible for the physical side, the environmental side, all of those physical data center checks that I used to do, we no longer have to do. Uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Google are going to handle that for you. You no longer have to go in there and check that stuff up. So they're responsible for the security of the cloud. But when it comes to the security in the cloud, that's on you. Uh, that's where that first kind of myth of, I don't know, I don't have a lot of control over what's going on in the cloud, we got to push back on that. Um, because that is on you. You still have to control who has access. You still can say where that data goes. You still have to say what those people can do with that data. And you get to see that at scale. You get that visibility and control really at scale in the cloud that might be really challenging elsewhere. Especially when you think about this increasing perimeter, folks continuing to deploy resources pretty easily, that can explode fast. And you want to be able to see those things. And I think it's really challenging to do without automation or without some of these, real, these integrated services. 
Over the next few slides, before we hop into a, a quick demo, I'm going to share some resources. And again, another disclaimer, Matt Fuller, who wrote this article, and the other folks that I'm going to share, I, I don't think they know who I am, uh, but I'm just sharing some resources that I found very helpful as, as I've learned about some of these things. And Matt wrote this article, I think he's the founder of, of CloudSploit, uh, that talks about how to enable login on every AWS service. When you, when you hear login on AWS, you typically think of CloudTrail. Uh, that's going to go out there and see all of the API activity from either a user, a resource, or, or, or really anything on AWS. But there's so much more. Uh, you can log a lot with each individual service, and oftentimes people don't even turn that on. Uh, they only think of CloudTrail, and they're thinking of those missing, uh, those missing information that they would want, but it's available if you just can dive deep into those details of, of what should be logged. And, for, for those, I see some folks writing some stuff down. I'm going to hop into my Slack channel and drop some of the resources that I'm sharing, so no pressure if you, if you don't capture this down and are able to get this, but I'll drop all of these resources, the links in there, uh, in, that, in that Slack channel. So when it comes to visibility and control, I actually think it's stronger in the cloud. You get to see things that you probably wouldn't have been able to see elsewhere unless you either wrote something yourself, uh, use some other 10 other SaaS tools together to get all this information. Uh, but you can do this natively on the cloud and then have all of those services talk to each other. And that's where we really start to see these benefits, right? When we start to use these deeply integrated services and we say, okay, I know that this tool is out here or this, this resource is out here doing this. I can see the user that's doing it. I can see what they're doing. I know my policies say that's not good. Let me go and fix that. Let me go and make sure that that's fixed because that's a known weakness, that's a known vulnerability that I can, that I can address. And, and that's where we really start to see the power of the cloud is because we can improve that detection and response. There's a metric that I uh, often check in compliance and then also an incident response, MTTR, the mean time to respond, where you want to dramatically have that number go down. You want to have the number, the time between detection and response you want that number to go down. You want it to be a shorter time frame, really because you, you don't want bad actors to take advantage of it, uh, but your teams. Uh, a lot of the things I think about when Alex was here talking about people, uh, that was really important because that's what I think about. Behind these metrics, behind these technologies, behind these tools, there's, there's individuals. There's somebody that's going out there and trying to fix these things and spending their time. And we should be thinking as technologists, as leaders, as whatever your role is, how can I reduce that time that that person is doing these manual repetitive tasks? All of us, all of you here in this room, your, your, your organizations didn't hire you to do repetitive tasks. Uh, they hired you to think. Uh, you, uh, this is a room full of really smart people, and you weren't hired just to repeat and do things that probably could be automated away. But oftentimes organizations leave, especially security, up for some kind of manual check. You know, you have somebody that says, I'm going to, I know that I don't want none of my S3 buckets to be public, but I'm still going to let people do it, and then when it happens, I'm going to have somebody go out and fix that. Doesn't make a ton of sense when you can let that person who you now are saying, you don't have to worry about that. We're going to automate that away. We're going to detect this issue. We're going to respond to it rapidly. We're going to fix it. And hey, we'll send you a notification. You go out and think. Be proactive. Be proactive when it comes to these security things, because that's what's needed in security. Security is really, especially compliance as well, is just really a reactive process. It's, it's we're reacting to things, which you kind of have to because the threats change on a day-to-day -day basis, but we can get more proactive, especially in the cloud using these deeply integrated services. And I'll, and I'll give an example here. So we all probably have heard of S3 buckets. If you do an, a Google search of S3 bucket breaches, you'll, you'll go down a rabbit hole of, and, and just be kind of baffled by all of the organizations that have, have experienced this. Uh, and it, it really frustrates me. Uh, there's not a lot of justification. You know, I've, I've heard some solid arguments for public S3 buckets. Uh, you're gonna, it's going to take a lot to convince me um, that that's needed in a, in a production environment with sensitive data. Uh, so there's really no reason to allow this weakness to happen. There's no reason that a user, an individual, human, should have to go out and check this stuff on a regular basis. And this is where it looks like I had some, a mashup up there on AWS config from my Google Slides to PowerPoint transfer, uh, which, is, which is par for the course. But uh, uh, this is where you can do this on, in the cloud. So we can use something like AWS config to say, hey, I only want my buckets in this production account to be private, and I want them to be encrypted at rest. 
I don't really care who creates them. I don't really care uh, what the reason is. If there's a bucket created, it needs to be encrypted at rest and it doesn't need to be public. And config will say, all right, great. Every time a new bucket's created, I'm gonna check that. And if not, I'm gonna spin up up that green arrow using AWS Systems Manager and I'm gonna automatically remediate it. I'm gonna automatically fix this without you having to call in a human. So this is where we start to talk about like human free zones, which I talk a lot about in, with, with folks in, in security is, how are we building these areas of your application? How are we building areas in your organization when it comes to security that we can eliminate humans so that they can go out and do proactive threat hunting, so they can go out and figure out and see some of these signals for when something bad is about to happen. And AWS, this, AWS config will go out, they'll fix it, they'll send a message, you know, so instead of at 4 a.m. that engineer getting woken up by a pager duty alert, they're able to stay asleep. Um, they get a little message that says, hey, this happened. Johnny spun up a public bucket last night, uh, but we fixed it already. You might want to go talk to Johnny about what, what's going on there and why they're doing it. And it's a really powerful way. You know, this is a rudimentary solution, but there are hundreds, I think hundreds now, of AWS config rules that are pre-built that can go out and say, here are some basic security things that I know I don't want to happen in my environment. Let me make sure that I check for this on a regular basis. But then if I see that it happened, I don't wanna just scream about it. I don't wanna just send another alert to Slack. I wanna go out and fix it. I wanna go out and actually remediate it. And that's where we can reduce that detection and response time. And now if there's AWS config rules that you have or things that you have in your organization there's not a rule for, the cool thing is you can write your own. Uh, and you can write your own remediation as well. Be actually before, uh, I think maybe nine months or so ago, config released a lot of these auto remediation rules. Before you had to write your own remediation using like a Lambda function, which was really simple, but now they do it for you. It's super easy. You just, a few clicks or a few lines of code there, you have these auto remediation set to where you're able to fix things that you identify in a pretty streamlined manner. And what I want to do quickly, and, and I'm going to tempt the demo gods here, um, I'm going to create a bucket here while we're, while we're in, this, in this talk. And we're going to let config in this test account that I have do its thing. And I should have uh, mirrored this so that I'm not looking up at the screen. Strange loop. We'll call it strange loop grand. And I'm going to do it with this strange loop account that I created. All right, so let me grab that. So we have a bucket created, and, and when we talk about increasing perimeter, this is, this is the problem, right? Um, with a couple, couple, couple little commands there, I'm able to uh, create a new resource. And let's check and see, did I create it according to my company's policies? Uh, did I create this bucket with the right bucket encryption? And server-side encryption configuration is not found, um, which, which, is, which is expected because I didn't set any of those uh, parameters when I launched this. Let's just, let's just check public access. And for those that don't know, if your bucket is publicly accessible, anyone with a AWS account can access that bucket. Uh, anyone that, that, any bad actor, if there's, if there's any sensitive data in their credit cards, PII, et cetera, they can go out and get that. Anyone with an AWS account. So anyone today right now can go on AWS and spin up a free tier account. And then if you have some skills, you can go out and just do a quick query and find all the public S3 buckets and find some sensitive data. And that's what those breaches you'll see out there are. Literally someone just did this. They just created a bucket, threw some credit cards, threw some PII in there and said, oh, just whoever wants it can get it. Uh, and, and they did. <laughs> they, they did go and get it. Uh, so we're going to let config do its thing in the background here as we continue talking. And when we pop back in, we'll see if those settings have changed on those buckets. And, and we'll see if the demo gods are, are in our favor. So next up, talk about reducing the attack surface, right? This is something that I hear often that I just, it, it, it baffles me where we're talking about the perimeter. We're talking about, man, it's, it's going to be really difficult for me to to manage this entire cloud. You know, we have all of these regions, I think over 18 regions now in AWS and, and similar numbers on Azure. What if I have users that are creating stuff in EU? What if I have users that are creating stuff in, in uh, US West and I only want to be in US East 1 or US East 2? The cool thing with the cloud is you don't have to just have the entire cloud as your environment. 
you can dramatically reduce this attack surface using a concept that all of you are probably familiar with here, guardrails, uh, where you can say, I'm only going to allow certain things to happen in certain areas. And on AWS, the way that you would do this is with a service called AWS Organizations, where you can segment out accounts, and this is really the recommended way to run your workloads in AWS. If you're not running a multi-account, workload uh, for you know, a single application, not multiple applications, but for a single application, you're probably doing it wrong because the blast radius of a potential bad event or incident, it dramatically grows when you put everything in one account. So with AWS organizations, you can segment these accounts out by business use case or, or business need, and it really allows you to limit when something bad happens. And I'll walk you through what we have here. So at the top there, you have your main account. That's where your finance folks are gonna be. That's where all your bills go. And really nothing else should be there. There should be no resources. There should be no users. It should really just be that finance team. You're gonna have a security account. This is where all your logs will go. This is where all of your security team will live in. And really no one else should have access to that. No one else should be in there doing anything, messing with those logs, be able to modify those, um, and that should really be segmented off. When I talk about limiting the blast radius, the people account that you see up there uh, in the security OU, you see an account next to the people, next to that uh, security account, that's where you can really limit a blast radius. And here's a really simple example. You have a user, for some reason that user doesn't have multi-factor authentication enabled, their account is compromised. I'm a bad actor, I hop into this account here, and I'm looking around, I'm like, all right, I'm in, what am I gonna do? Um, let me start figuring out what are the resources. And I'm getting access denied every time I try to describe EC2 instances or describe databases or whatever it may be. And the reason is, is because in this account where you have users, there's no resources. The only thing that that user can do is use identity and access management and STS or security token service to role switch into these other accounts. You don't have to have any resources in the same account where your users are. And that's how you limit the blast radius, right? If something bad happens, if my account is compromised, the bad actor comes in and they hop into a conference room. Imagine if you came in here early and there's nobody in here. The bad actor's in your account, they're looking around like, there's nothing here. What am I doing? Why am, why am I in this account? There's nothing here because everything else are in these other accounts. And the way that you set those protections around those accounts are called service control policies or SCPs where you basically are able to put these guardrails around the account, really there's no limit to the things that you can reduce. You know, you can say, I only want these users using these specific services. I only want these folks working out of US East One. If I know there's no reason for my team or me to be hosting or doing stuff in other regions, US West Two or EU, I can say only work in US East One. Uh, if you're an administrator, you have God-level access. Even if you have all of that access, you still can't do anything unless you're in that region and, and you're really reducing that perimeter. Your team doesn't have to worry about is someone spinning up resources in this other region and then you find out when you get that bill at the end of the month that you have some RDS instances out in a, in a U.S. West. And I, I chuckled because that recently happened to me um, in, a, in a little test environment that I was doing for a workshop. But really cool way to limit things. You can say, don't disable any security services. You can, I wanna make sure that guard duty is enabled, security hubs enabled, all these other services are enabled, and no one else can disable them. You can say, I only want a certain type of EC2 instance or RDS instance deployed. So when you think about configuration management, you can do, use SEPs here that reduce that attack surface. And there's really two really good resources that I would recommend to you all as you're thinking about some of these concepts of guardrails and, and, and reducing that attack surface. The first is this AWS Security Roadmap by Scott Piper. And if you, uh, I would highly recommend following Scott on Twitter, uh, super great follow. But this roadmap right here, if you've inherited an AWS account, if you're doing anything in the security world or you're thinking about moving to the security world and you're hosting on AWS, this is literally your roadmap. This will tell you step by step what, is, what right looks like if you are setting up an AWS account from scratch, getting security right. And you see there on stage six, Scott talks about the reducing that attack surface. And he gets into AWS organizations. He suggests a little bit of a different method of those AWS accounts that I shown, but this concept's the same. 
reduce that blast radius, segment out your accounts by business need or business justification, and you're going to set yourself up for success. So this is a really valuable document. Highly recommend anyone that's getting into AWS security or it has to do AWS security to follow Scott and then also get this. This screenshot here is also another resource uh, from a site called CloudSec Docs um, from Marco Lancini. He also produces a, a weekly newsletter that's really great. But these SCPs, I talked about service control policies. He's already wrote a bunch of them that you can literally just go to his site, copy and paste, and go out and implement immediately in your environment. So things like not being able to disrupt guard duty, root accounts not being able to do anything, you can apply on certain accounts to make sure that you're protecting from that. Not being able to create IAM access keys. You may have in that production environment where your application is, there should be no users and no, hard, no, uh, no uh, permanent or persistent access keys, right? So you can do that from an SCP perspective and say, I no longer want this to happen. You no longer can, can, can create access keys in our account. And these SCPs really put those nice guardrails around your account. So now your teams don't have to worry about, is something bad going to happen that I know I don't want to happen? We can just eliminate that from the scratch as we segment out these accounts and apply these, these SCPs a, a, across the board. So CloudSec Docs from Marco, uh, uh, Scott Piper's AWS Security Roadmap, really powerful resources. And I'll actually show an example here as we pop back into the, the CLI to, to show you the region, the region example. So I'm going to go back and check this same bucket that we just created a little bit ago. Um, and hopefully, there we go. We're now true. You know, we're, we're now, the demo gods are in our favor. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was a little, you know, heart, uh, you probably saw my heart beating. Uh, so the demo gods are in our favor. We, we now, config went out and did its thing. You know, I'm just sitting here having a conversation with you and a misconfiguration that I know is bad, that I know is causing an issue and could potentially be really, really bad for our organization is fixed. And there's a message being sent off to Slack saying, hey, AJ's doing bad things. You might want to go talk to him. Uh, you might want to go figure out what's going on. Uh, let's check the encryption really quick. And there we go. We got AES-256. Um, we're doing the right things. Uh, and again, like this is a very simple example. And you can get extremely complex with config rules. You can write your own. You can write your own remediation. You can write your own notification. Maybe you don't want to auto remediate. You know, maybe you want to just scream at someone about it and do some other things. Maybe put it in the sandbox or something. And you can do that as well. But it's just, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine when we constantly see these, these vulnerabilities, these breaches happen for things that are avoidable. Uh, things that you can, you can really eliminate that risk from materializing by reducing that time between detection and response. And now let's talk about those, those SCPs really quick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and try to take a look at some of the EC2 instances that I have. And I'll do this in US East 1. And I have another account, Strange Loop Region. You'll be able to see uh, there's this EC2 instance I created uh, a couple days ago uh, for this talk that I'm able to get that. And I'm going to run that same command. I'm just going to change the region. We're going to go and say, can I see the EC2 instances in US East 2? And I'm not allowed to perform that operation. I still have the same permissions, still an administrator, still have access to the same account. The only thing I changed was the region. That's that service control policy. That's, the, that's where you can say, look, there's no reason for you to be in US East 2. I don't even want you looking at EC2 instances over there. I don't want you doing anything over there. I don't want you creating access keys. And that's why service control policies are so powerful when we talk about reducing that attack service, when we talk about being able to limit the blast radius of things and putting those guardrails around accounts. This is something that you can do that now we can eliminate a lot of that manual labor. We can eliminate a lot of those issues that come up and are taking away people's time. You're sending out that security engineer, hey, go clean up my AWS account. I found that I had resources in seven different regions that don't belong. I need you to go clean that up and figure out what's going on. Not needed anymore when you use these SCPs, uh, which, is, which is really powerful. And, and one thing that I want to just talk about with service control policies the way that they work, uh, you have your identity and access management policy that says uh, AJ is an admin. He can do all of these things in AWS. He has uh, you know, God level access to do all of these things. That service control policy is applied on top of it. Um, that says 
yes, you have all of that access. Yes, you are an administrator, but you can only do things in these parameters. Uh, those guardrails go on top of it. So that's really where your permissions and the service control policies come into play is that sweet spot right there in the middle where the service control policy is not going to say you're allowed to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, that's a mistake I often see. You know, we see folks create user accounts that are like, I'm not giving that person any permissions, and then I'm going to apply an SCP on top of it. They're not gonna, nothing's gonna work. <laughs> You're not gonna be able to do anything. The person still needs IAM permissions, but the service control policies put that guardrail around it that say, I can't go out and do things, even if I'm an administrator. If I'm in US East 2, can't do it. Can only do those same activities in US East 1. Uh, so really, really powerful. And as we think about our people, as we think about the people behind these metrics, the people behind these vulnerabilities and these flaws, we have to get security folks, security engineers, back to doing what they were hired to do. Thinking, being proactive, not responding and doing manual repetitive things that could be avoided if we're doing, if we're applying these guardrails, if we're thinking about security in a cloud native way. So to wrap up here, you know, we often hear a lot about DevSecOps, and uh, I know it's a, a buzzword in, in a lot of circles, and, and a lot of folks are starting to not like that word. It's kind of transition like zero trust to, to just become a buzzword, but it's real, <laughs> you know? DevSecOps is real, and we should be thinking about it. But when I think about DevSecOps, I'm not thinking about tools and technology. I'm not thinking about all these processes. I'm thinking about the mentality. I'm thinking about the mindset, I'm thinking about the culture shift at an organization to where security is talked about and brought up early on. Uh, and we have to start asking these questions. Uh, are we thinking about security early on? Are we having the necessary conversations early on in our process of either migrating an application, building out a new feature, whatever it may be, are we asking about security early on? And this doesn't have to be security professionals. You know, security is really a team sport because oftentimes, if it's a bad security organization, folks are hiding from security. You know, if, if, if security is seen as a blocker to the organization, we're gonna work around it. We're gonna figure out our way to do other things to get what we have to get done. But that's because security is not brought on early on in the process. So uh, a, a challenge here for, for you all is, you know, ask about security early on. Talk about security. You don't have to be a security engineer. You don't have to be a security professional to bring this stuff up and to think about and say, hey, are we, are we leveraging all of the things that are available to us to do things the right way from a security perspective? The other question, and, and, and you know, I've just kind of repeated this, but how are the tools, the technologies, the processes, how are they improving the quality of life of our people? Uh, we have to eliminate this need for uh, this industry to uh, be uh, burnout to be thought of with what we do for a living. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, you know. We don't have to burn out to be successful. Uh, we don't have to, you know, eliminate our time with our families and ignore our health, do all of these things that we constantly see in the industry just because we work in tech. You know, we can think about how to improve the quality of life of not only ourselves but people around us by asking ourselves, what are the tools and technologies and the processes that we're having in place, and how is that impacting someone downstream? Yes, it may enable you to move a little bit faster to do things in one way, but who else is that going to impact later on? Uh, is there a way that you can make this process easier for them and improve their quality of life? Because at the end of the day, behind these tools, behind all these technologies, it's just us. It's just regular folks like this. Uh, that, are, that are interested in Googling all day and trying hard. Uh, and, and we are the ones behind this. And we have to really, really, I think, in the future of this new hybrid work environment that we're moving into, the quality of life for people, the, the culture of organizations, the way that people are treated is going to be way more important than any of the technologies or tools or processes that we can put in place. And if we start to think about security early on, if we start to think about some of these concepts early on, we may just make the lives better of those folks that are behind some of these metrics and, and tools and processes. I want to just challenge another concept that I, that I, as you leave here, and you know, again, I mentioned I wanted this to start a conversation and kick off things as you're going throughout the rest of the day into some of these really great talks that are coming up. Security and speed are not opposing forces. We don't have to pick one. You don't have to pick speed over security or security over speed. 
we can do both. We can move fast and we can do it in a secure manner. And you can do it with guardrails. You can do it with automating detection and response. You can do it with building security earlier on in the process and having conversations about security and shifting the mindset where security is not an afterthought. And then lastly, automate everything. You know, I'm uh, a fairly lazy guy, <laughs> so I'm gonna try to automate things as much as possible. Uh, I'll probably spend six hours trying to automate something that probably takes me two hours to actually complete, uh, just so I don't have to spend that two hours later on. But wherever we can automate so that our security folks, so that we can get back to doing what we were hired to do, which is to think, uh, which is to be proactive, which is to use our skill sets to identify potential weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the future, uh, but also just be able to, to, to operate in a manner that's not repetitive and draining on an individual because I'm doing things that, can, that are already preventing the known weaknesses. So I'll, I had a lot of fun with this presentation. I, I want to leave with a few thoughts. Uh, the first being, uh, we're hiring at Bite Check. So uh, if you, uh, <laughs> I know there's a lot of engineers here. Uh, I'm looking for some leaders. I'm looking for some junior folks. So if you're interested in making compliance suck less, let's, let's have a conversation and, and building some cool things and doing it in a manner where uh, you as a person will be cared about more so than what you do for a living. Uh, the second thing that I like to, to mention, and I, and I just have, I cannot, uh, do a talk without, uh, without mentioning this, is we often hear about a cybersecurity skill shortage. We often hear about a talent shortage in the industry, uh, which, you know, it may be true. Uh, but I think the only re the way that we fill this, the only way that we solve a lot of the security problems, we need more people. And the way that we do that is by hiring more diverse candidates. We need to hire more women. We need to hire more minorities. And we need to look around and challenge what are our hiring practices. I don't think there's a pipeline problem. I think there's enough qualified people out there that are minorities and women. We just have to look around and say, where are we going to find these folks? Are we still going to the same places? Are we just asking everybody in our organization to do referrals and they go back to their own networks? And, and, and we can change that. And, and I think it just takes each individual to ask the question, to look around in their shops and say, are we doing things? Are we thinking about diversity? Are we thinking about hiring more women and minorities? Because it's important, especially in the cybersecurity industry, not just from what it looks like, but diversity of thought is important to protect our environment and protect our applications. So, thank you. <laughs> That concludes my talk. I, I wanted to finish up early so that we can get these walls up for the next talks. I, I had a ton of fun. I hope to chat with all of you and, and, and have some conversations over the next few days. And I hope that you leave this and, and think about security a little bit differently and figure out ways that you can do things differently in your environment. I'll be active on the Slack channel if there's any questions or concerns and I'll be hanging out here. But thanks everyone for attending and getting up early this morning to, to listen to me and I, I really appreciate the opportunity, Strange Loop. <laughs>